What's going on, guys? It's Jason Park with the Hypertube Podcast. I am here with Ivan Malikin and Sarah Jane, the duo that writes, produces, directs, edits, scores, sells the film, distributes the film. They do everything. Welcome, guys. How are you guys doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much. So tell me, how did this duo, how did it start? What are the origins? Um, 2006. Yeah, it's a long, long time ago. Um, yeah, back in Melbourne, Australia. So I actually didn't want to be a filmmaker when I was younger. I wanted to be a writer. So I've done, you know, professional writing at uni and I wanted to write like um, fantasy novels, even mm. worked on, you know, a few drafts, got one draft finished, but um i had a friend back in uni who was obsessed with films and he dragged me into like you know doing like you know, horror characters behind a mask playing a serial killer eventually i'd start like i'm writing with him and then i'll start you know co-directing with him and once that happened it was kind of you seeing your words come to life you know right before your eyes and it's like an intoxicating feeling so i just like kind of you know slowly drift away from like writing your know, no- novels and started writing scripts kind of full time and then that transitioned into like um, filmmaking and then what about you sarah uh me how did it start for me i was working in a supermarket and someone asked me to come on and um uh, direct a film i had no idea what they were talking about but i made my way to the film set and it was a channel 31 which was like uh, like a TV station in Australia, like a smaller TV station, independent one. So I went in there and instead of doing art direction, they put me in, because I didn't know how to do design. They wanted me to design posters. I didn't know how to do that. And so then they just put me in the art department and I built a police station. So we built all the walls and we dressed it, we painted everything. So I just started constructing. And from there, I just wanted to keep working on films. And I met Ivan in 2006. Mm-hmm. And we just kept working together. And then I joined Nexus Production Group, his company, in 2013. And that's when we sort of got together as well. Yeah, eventually we got married. And these days we live in Croatia. I was going to get to that. I was going to be like, was it love at first sight? What happened? (laughs) Wait, so let me get this straight. You were working at a grocery store and yeah. they were like hey do you want to direct this thing like how random is that or did you have yeah, someone someone said oh i heard that you're a great art director and i'm like i don't know what you're talking about but i want to be i want to know what what you're doing they brought me on the set and i just was told can you build like we're building a police station we need to build the sets so i just started building because i i did have a construction sort of background with my dad like he built the house that we were living in so he always always sort of taught me that and I also have like an interior design background, so it kind of just worked. So, okay, what was the first project that you guys worked on together? Because you guys have so many credits between the oh. both of you. What's the first was film? Might have been Reckoning. No, no, the one with Tom Vogel where I did the. Oh, that's actually how we met. Yeah, but it, it wasn't our film. It's it's called like um one, one in a million. million. And it was a film by a friend of ours, and we both worked on the set, but we weren't on the same days. But the film was actually quite successful. It went to a big festival in Australia called Trot Fest in Sydney. So we both were in the state to like, um, you know, watch the film at this festival, and then we met at the after party. That's actually how we became friends. Um, but in terms of officially working together on one of our own films, I think it's Reckoning. Reckoning? I, I think it's, it's, like, it's sort of like maybe Reckoning is a short film, a thriller about a convict who comes back up, you know, to kind of confront his ex-girlfriend who's now like um, with the brother of the convict. And Sarah was, you know, doing pretty much production design and art department on that film, like, you know, you know short film, because everyone does like multiple roles. And, you know, just continue kind of like, yeah, a lot of short films together first before Sarah wanted to direct something of her own. Dusk. Yeah. And how was that directing on your own? Um, it was my first film as a director and the first thing I wrote as well for mm-hmm. film. Yeah, that was hard because um, I was, I'm was. i also a production designer, so I was doing production design at that point. That's what I was doing for Ivan and on other films before I joined Nexus. So it was hard to be dressing the sets, doing the costumes and then directing, so it was a hard way to learn. I uh, didn't, and looking back on it, I didn't want to do that again. I just wanted to focus on directing because it took a lot. Like I'm telling the actors what to do while I'm trying to dress the set and I'm trying to get the props, and it just wasn't working. It worked in the end, but it just wasn't wasn't something that was enjoyable. Yeah, because I've I noticed that you know, you guys wear so many hats. 
Now, when it comes to wearing so many hats, is that because of the budgets that are allocated per project? And in order to alleviate those budgets, you're like, okay, let me wear all of these hats. Or is it like, do you just prefer to work that way? No, it's, it's the system too. Um, you know, as you go along, you kind of slowly learn about like, um, each position, you know, at first, like I knew nothing about cinematography at all, but these days I've actually like, you know, DOP a few of my own features and I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to say I'm the greatest like DOP around, but I know enough about like, you know, lighting now and about camera, you know, framing and stuff like that to, you know, do a decent job at it. Um, but yeah, it just becomes like, okay, if you can do this role and you can do this role, you can do this role, then you suddenly don't have to hire someone to do that and you save, you know, a lot of money. And obviously, you know, how expensive your films are to make. So any way you can save money, um, it's always a bonus. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of those things where, you know, as a filmmaker, I almost feel like you're a better filmmaker or a better director if you know how to edit. <laughs> yeah. Because you kind of know where things are going to go. Yeah, I agree. Like I, I was, uh, I've been editing for a long time. Like even though like a kind of corporate work uh, for a long time, and the fact that I have that editing background, it just makes directing so much easier. You, you, know, you just kind of know. All right, I need to get this this shot. I need to get this shot. I, I know my coverage. Like I'm not going to miss anything. So like um, it just makes things so much easier. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so, what is it like, you know, working together? And and the reason why I ask this is. I shot a reality show for my wife. And mm -hmm. when my wife and I work together in this particular space of film, I don't want to say we bump heads, but I'm so focused on what needs to get done that it's not that I mean, but I'm not the nicest either. I'm kind of like, okay, we move, move, move. Let's go, 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 go. So how is it with you guys, you know, being married, you guys do these projects together. It, oh, let's do it. Yeah. Let's... How is that? Dive into it. <laughs> Don't know. We've kind of got a dynamic going now. Like we've worked together for so many years and I think we have a bit of different personalities. So it kind of like, it kind of like balances each other. Like yeah. if he has some crazy idea, I can bring him back down. And if I think he's being too, too like con conservative with something, I said, let's just try something else and we'll try a different way. So I think it just kind of balances. Yeah. We have different ideas as well. I'm more of a visual person as well. So it helps me yeah. to see things. Yeah. Sarah will be the one that'll come up with the storyboards and stuff like that because I can't, you know, draw to save myself. Or like, um, you know, I just don't kind of like, you know, really picture the world that way. But yeah, I think there is like a balance that we strike. Like, um, you know, and it's good always having someone that you can talk to and like, you know, kind of bounce your ideas off. And, you know, kind of like, you know, like Sarah said, like I, I tend to be kind of more kind of extreme. Like I want to push like, you know, kind of boundaries and stuff like that. But like, yeah, Sarah kind of bringing it back to earth. Yeah, but then there's like times when you out. do shots that I think it could be, it would look better if we do it this way. And I'll tell them, how about this way? And then we end up having a different shot. And I look at the perspective as well, because I learned all that from my design thing. Like, okay, what's, where's the perspective of the character? So I look at the whole frame and I'm like, okay, we need mm -hmm. something in this corner. It's just something that I'm used to doing visually. She's taught me a lot so, about color and yeah, set dressing and stuff like that. So you, you learn a lot from each other. Well, it, it sounds like, you know, being that you both are within this creative space of filmmaking, that you're able to take the, I want to say the, the empathy of a female, and then you're able to take the, the heavy metal of a, of a male, and you're able to blend those two worlds to give a more, I would say, complete film. Because as a filmmaker, I'm only coming from the perspective of a man, but she has insight right i'm assuming that that you wouldn't necessarily think of him like oh okay yeah she this character would do that yeah that makes sense yeah very true like even just recently we're editing one of our films called four fans uh, and there's a text conversation between like um two women in the film and artists say, okay what do girls say on text like, does this make sense i uh, write this for me it's like yeah i need a perspective and like we do actually do a, a work with a lot of female characters so like, yeah, I'm always kind of like, yeah, tapping Sarah on the shoulder. Okay. Like, does this make sense? Is this what a woman would say? Is this how she'd react? So definitely like, um, it, it's a good balance. I can be more aggressive than you though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> more, I'm more mean, aren't I? Sometimes. Yeah, I can be the mean director, the mean um, producer. Mm -hmm. You know, women have a way. 
Uh, let, let me ask you this. Out of all the projects that you guys have done up until this point, excluding your latest film, excluding because the latest ones always has that air of newness, what what has been your guys' like favorite project up until this point? For me, it's a film called Friends, Furs and Fireworks. Right. Yeah, okay, so it's a feature we've done back in, I think, 2017 or 18. <clears throat> and we actually shot it in a single night um, on New Year's Eve. And it was the first film we actually done that was completely improvised. So up to then, we'd be always be working with scripts and they're a traditional way of filmmaking. Can I just say, um, not to cut you off, keep that thought. I literally had a conversation with my friend today. I was like, mm -hmm. bro, what if we just shot a film in like one or two days, completely improv, and here's the premise. So I literally yeah. just had this conversation today. Uh, but continue, continue. Yeah, well, well, that's kind of what we did. Like, um, you know, it was kind of like, at that point, we'd all been doing food for like you know, 10 years and we're kind of like you reached a level where we're, we're burning out. And the previous film that we did, like a short film called Half, oh, there was like just so many cooks in the kitchen and so many egos and we kind of just had enough. And we need to do something like you're completely different to rediscover our passion for filmmaking. And so we just gathered a group of friends um, you know, for us, New Year's Eve, traditionally, like, you know, very boring, like, uh, the party's always a letdown, okay, what can we do instead? Okay, how about we make a film? So we came up with the idea, got our friends together, and it was a wonderful experience, and that's why, like, you know, for me, that's my favourite film. That's where having two directors is good as well, because, you yeah. know, we sort of help each other there, like, he directs one scene and I'll do another scene. Well, that was, because we were directing in different locations. Yeah, that's just... how we're able to do it, like, in a single night, like, you know, because... Yeah. Yeah, so we'll go somewhere else and direct a scene. I'll take a couple of actors, I'll direct another scene at a different location. But even when we don't do it in a single night, like even on our last film, we were filming in Berlin. Ivan was helping the DP set up the shot while I was directing the actors about what was going to happen in the scene. So mm. it was handy to have that when we don't have a lot of crew. We only had a makeup artist with us. Mm -hmm. So so dive into that, right? Um, uh I'm assuming, because when I was talking to my buddy about this, we had a premise. I was like, okay, this is the premise. This is where the story is going. So as long as we can improv in this direction, we're okay. How did you guys plan for the improv film? Like, what, what led you guys? So, yeah, we, we start with the premise, but we also do an outline of kind of each scene and, like, you know, kind of what's, what needs to happen in this scene, um, what's the points for the actors to hit. And how the actors are going to get there, like what they're actually going to say, that's up to them. But like everyone has a general idea, okay, what needs to happen in the scene. So and we just direct them, like we want more of this, we want less of this. Yeah, and we generally will start like you know, kind of like with a with a wide, um, you know, first take is just kind of like you're know, playing around. Let's, let's see what happens. But once we kind of get a groove, okay, this is working. We like this part of the conversation. Let's do something again for the next take this part is dragging like yeah, let's eliminate that you don't need to talk about that at all so we're kind of like yeah, we'll just kind of hone it down and you know eventually you end up with a like yeah, fully improvised film and ivan's actually got a book about this called improv for indie filmmakers mm -hmm. i do the marketing for nexus as well <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so yeah he's got a book called improv for indie filmmakers it's on amazon it's really small you can read it in like one afternoon and it's been really helpful for uh, other filmmakers, even directors. Yeah. And a lot of prep for time is actually like the rehearsal become really important for improv because yeah. like um, pretty much you're asking the actors to just become this character and it's like you're, you're thinking as a character and you're just responding to the other like your characters around you. So it just becomes like you're natural for the actors. So we spend a lot of time actually in character. A lot of work is done yeah. in rehearsals. Go into their past relationship, playing games, like, you know, taking them out on dates in character and stuff like that. So they actually, like, you know, kind of get, you know, fully immersed into who they are for this film. Even teaching them, like, showing them how do you, how would the character walk, how would the char character hail a taxi, things like that. So they, they do everything. How would they wait for a bus? Mm -hmm. Did you guys find that the actors had, uh, that, it, that they enjoyed it a lot? Because you're typically not giving that extreme freedom especially when you're making a movie they, they do like you know, every time i kind of like you know, put a casting notice for an improvised film like you know actors that respond they're always are kind of really interested oh this is something different this gives me a chance to like you know, to play to really explore an actor so yeah actors are really excited about this process it depends where we were because when we did it in malta a lot of them didn't really know what it was and that was a bit confusing for them. Even like the deferred contract and stuff, they didn't really have an idea about it. But I think the more 
how do you say the countries, the more forward thinking countries, they kind of know. And the actors who are like studied it, overseas, it they kind of know. So now that you guys, you guys have done so many projects, one of the most fondest memories comes from an imp improvised film. Mm -hmm. uh, have you guys dabbled in other improvised films as well? Every film we've done since that film has been improvised, except for our two documentaries, mm -hmm. which wow. is kind of as well. <laughs> and let me, so I would assume that if that's the case, then you guys probably uh, get the best performance, the most natural and real performance out of actors when it's improvised because they're not thinking about the words that they're going to say next. Is that mm -hmm. pretty true? Exactly. That's yeah. the truth. So you have to just be in the moment and you don't know what's coming next. So it's, it's not actually like they're okay, they know what's the next line. They're just waiting for the cue. You have to just listen and respond to whatever happens. So they, they do sort of develop a script by themselves. Like they sort of start repeating the same thing over and over, which is great for you as an editor. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about saying it five different times. It's five different ways. So, yeah. And I was going to ask about that, right? So when I had that conversation, I was like, okay, the way that this will work is we'll just shoot wide shots and then it'll go to the next, to the next, to the next. But you're mm -hmm. saying that if during the improvised scene, you capture it on that wide, let's say that's the master shot, and mm -hmm. then there's a subject matter that really catches your attention, will you go and get close-ups on that from that person talking, or how does that work? We use two cameras. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We will get the close-ups from that. Yeah, and yeah, you shoot two cameras when we have like your two actors. Ah, oh, so that's the secret sauce is having that additional camera mm -hmm. so it's not a boring one shot. That's, that's correct. What do you guys shoot on? Uh, we have two black magic pocket cinema cameras. Yeah, I'm a fan of the black magic. Uh, I shot my first feature on the, the black magic pocket cinema camera 6K. And mm -hmm. then I went to the red Komodo. And then I went back to the black magic 6K full frame camera. Yeah, it's just a really versatile camera, and the price point is awesome, isn't it? The 4K is good for us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, even if you think about it, like from an editing standpoint or anything that's released on Amazon, Prime, Tubi, I mean, they're streaming it at 720, 1080p anyways. Yeah, exactly. You can still deliver like um, you know, at 1080 these days, and it's not a hassle. Like pretty much all platforms are going to accept that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so how did you guys stumble, you know, on to improvised filmmaking. This is such a fascinating subject. Like we ran a we ran a film sorry, I cut you off. We ran a film festival. When did we start that? 2015? Nine. nine. You started in nine. I joined in fifteen or fourteen. And we saw a couple of films that were mumble core. One of them that was dubbed the first Australian mumble core film. Mm -hmm. Then we started watching films like Hannah Takes the Stairs. And we started watching the, was it the comfy couch or the comfy chair? Yeah, puffy getting, chair. The puffy chair. Keep puffy getting chair. that one confused. <laughs> yeah, we watched that and we started watching a lot of those mumblecore films and we fell in love with the idea of it. And then we made our, we did our experiment, which was Friends, Foes and Fireworks, and we just kept going from there. So that's how we found it. Mm -hmm. We also were trained in 2019 in Basel by Robert Machan, who teaches the Mike Lee improvised technique. So he, teach, he taught us exactly how Mike Lee makes films, which is a little bit different to how we make improvised films. We use the Joe Swanberg method, so it's closer to what Joe Swanberg does because Mike Lee actually distills and makes a script with the actors and then they shoot from that. That's not how we work. Interesting. Interesting. So do you guys think that you guys will ever go back to, to writing like the actual story and then being like, okay, this is what you're going to do. Or do you guys just prefer the improvised method? Because when I think about it and I think of today's mm -hmm. world of cinema and world of movies that almost having, if, especially if you're on a, a smaller budget, having a better performance through improvisation, especially if they're a, the actor's able to do it and pull it off. Mm -hmm. Almost it might be a, a better than having a very limited script. Or you could have a script and just improv from the script. There's some, a lot of, um, if you're going to go for funding, there's a lot of funding bodies that don't accept no script. Mm -hmm. I accidentally wrote a script because in Malta we wanted to shoot a story, but the film commission said, oh, no, we can't, we can't take something that's not scripted. We can't just have a concept. So I quickly wrote a script for them. I went to hand it in to them and then they didn't open the fund. 
So I still have that script and I've been working it for the last, well, I've been working for the last year again, mm-hmm. just in the hope to sell it. But now I'm tempted, should we shoot it or should we sell it or should I direct it? I don't know. But I'm, I'm just working with it because I'm trying to learn how to write screenplays. So I do enjoy writing screenplays because I like writing. Yeah. But I still write the concepts. Like we still write the concepts yeah. for all the improvised stuff. It's just more. Yeah. Loose. We prefer you know, doing improv, but like we're not opposed like, um, you know, to doing scripted work also. It's just whatever the project calls for, that's the direction like, you know, that will go. And if, you know, if we need to seek funding for something, then, yeah, usually we need to actually write the script for these projects. We tried to change the commission's mind. Commissioner's mind, but we couldn't do it. Not yet. Not that progressive. So they still use the traditional filmmaking. You know, you have to have a distributor. You have to have, like, co-production. You have to have this much money. It's just like, that's not how we work. So Yeah, I, I was going to ask, how is, what's the process like in Croatia? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we never actually saw funding here in Croatia. We've just been kind of doing our own thing, like um, producing films on our own dime or like, you know, the kind of the sales we get from our previous films there, according to like our new films. There must be funding because I went to a filmmaking mm. expo in London, was it last year when I went? And I met the people from the Vazadem Film Commission, which is another area of Croatia. It's like an hour from Zagreb, right, mm-hmm. where we are. And they said they're making the first um, Australian-Croatian production, which we're Australian, and that was really interesting to me. So mm. they actually do have funds. Just never actually looked into it because we don't speak the language also. Like we know someone who works in the film industry here, but she's Croatian, so she speaks the language, so she can go from job to job. And they they do film stuff here. Like we've seen yeah. Hollywood productions in Zagreb. Yeah, but before like Croatia, we used to live in Malta. We actually found that easier. Like we actually were communicating with the film commission there. And it's like a small like your know, film scene, but your know, English is actually the official government language, so it's easier to actually um, you know, kind of get to know the industry there than it is in Croatia. They do have a database here that you can put yourself on for crew, but I don't know how to. I think I looked at it, but I haven't paid to be on it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. Like, I think in today's world, when it comes to film, I think that there's two things. One, there's going to be a, a huge influx and rise in indie film, because I think that's where you're going to get the most original IP is from individual creators like yourself. And secondly, I think that the funding for these big projects are going to continue to shrink to where before they would give you $60 million to do this film. Now you're going to have to do it for six. This other project that's, you know, 5 million. Now you're going to have to do it for 500,000. So I think that by you guys heading that ship of like, we're just going to do it ourselves. Yeah. You don't get all the luxuries of a bigger project, but you guys also don't have to wait for permission. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big advantage of being like a completely independent. Like you're not asking anybody um for permission to make your film you can like you know all right you have limited resources but you can actually write something based on the resources you have and like it's something that you know you can pull off so you know there's there's freedom in it but at the same time like you know if someone gave me like you know five hundred thousand to make a film i wouldn't turn it down sometimes you get sometimes there's not much difference between making like a twenty thousand dollar film or making a fifty thousand one like it's not gonna really change a lot of the production so i don't Mm. think a lot of money produces depends obviously millions is different to thousands <laughs> yeah no absolutely do you guys think that you guys will uh continue shooting for uh uh for the long term with the black magic uh 4k or do you guys think that you guys will change camera systems at any point um well, we're not sure like um you know the last film that we done after the act there was also shot the black magic but we had a dop on that one and like you know he was just okay he was happy to use those cameras um i think it just kind of depends on you know, the next project, like, you know, what is the best kind of camera for the job? Like, we don't want to be kind of locked in to any particular camera. It's kind of like just a project by project basis. For what we're doing now, it works, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. And is there a film scene, like, I guess, like, a, not a scene, is there a community of filmmakers, indie filmmakers in Croatia? There, there is, because I've talked to a few people and they've said to me that there, one guy was running a festival, I was speaking to him about festival entry, and he said to me he's looking for work for his production company. So there are companies around, but I think they're probably doing more tourism and videos like that. I don't know if they're actually making films. There was a film set, there was a film, a smaller one being shot just down near, near the park mm. here near our place. It looked like a smaller production, but they had tents and everything, so they were a bit more. They weren't the Hollywood production size, but... When you guys are filming in Croatia, are the um, are the people that live there are they very welcoming to it, or, or do they hate it? Like, what's that process like? 
uh, in Berlin, it was hard. Remember Berlin? People like didn't want to be on camera. Actually, mm-hmm. there was a rule there. There's something to do with the law where you can't show people on film or something. Mm-hmm. But here, I don't know. know. We're kind of we, we gorilla it, so like um, we don't pay too much attention. So we like, don't know. You know. We don't know what the laws are. As, here. as long as they don't look at the camera, like um, when they're walking past, then we don't mind. We just kind of go out and just do our thing, like. But when you're early, you have a crew of three people, like you're kind of one or two actors in the scene, you can get away with that stuff. When you don't have a full rig or a dolly like following someone around on a main road, it's not really like obvious that something's happening. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask that. So when you guys are guerrilla filmmaking, um, are you doing a lot of handheld? Like how are you getting away with it without people bothering you too much? Because you're right. If there's two of you and there's two actors, (laughs) they're sitting there talking. Yeah, you can get away with it. But like, I guess, what are you doing on the camera side? Uh, we'll just kind of use our gimbal, like um, kind of strip the black magic down to you know get rid of the cage and just put it on a gimbal. Um, there's no need for two directors. I won't follow. Like if it's going to be on yeah. the street and it's going to be like in a crowd or something, I don't need to follow along as well. Or one act, one director will go, the other person will stay behind. Yeah, and like the actors are wearing the pal, so you know it's inconspicuous. Well, we did it on New Year's in front of police. Yeah. But like, these days, it's kind of like you know, it could just be it could be someone doing a YouTube video. Like you know, the the kind of rig is so small these days. It could just be someone vlogging, I like, guess, uh, for all the people that they walk past. As you know, it could just be a mistake for like a YouTuber. Um, you just give it a go and say stop. You just yeah. oh sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, exactly. Like what, what's the worst that can happen, really? No, that's that's awesome. You know, it's, it's almost like they ask for uh, forgiveness, not permission. Because uh, mm-hmm. by the time they approach you, it's like oh, we already got the shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So, talk to me about your latest project. Um. We have two yeah, we have two, films. Two. And I was just working on the color prep for one today, sitting off to the colorist. It's called After the Act. Actually, Cyril is just working on the outline for it. So do you, oh, do you yeah. remember it? The outline. The outline, it. the synopsis. I was writing the synopsis, but it's really confusing. I think I changed it about five times in the last hour, trying to work out what it is. Uh, do you want to know? What do you want to know what so, it's about? It's about... How did I write it? I totally yeah, you can keep it, it general. <laughs> I made an old one. So a trio of friends are dealing with the fallout of infidelity over a single day and night. That was the original one, but I've changed it now. And we actually shot that one in, in Berlin. Mm. So because we knew like a couple of actors and crew over there, and like it's just an eight-hour well, actually, I think it's maybe 10 hours from Croatia. So it was a we drove road up. trip. So it was a fun road trip to take, stop on Prague on the way enjoy Prague. So that's the advantage of being in Europe, like a you know, um, couple of hours in a new country. And we found another one in Croatia. Mm-hmm. When did we shoot that one? The, another one is called Four Fans, and that's about a naive student who becomes a cam girl, but pretty much she gets more than she bargained for. And she's drawn into this you know, lurid world where people you know, kind of betray her. And take advantage of so, for Somehow we've ended up with two features that impose exactly the same time and it's like yeah it's kind of stretching our resources but well, there's also a documentary cats of malta uh-huh. which we have got and getting on pbs in october so i've been editing that as well i'll be doing the marketing for that congratulations so that's pbs mm-hmm. yeah congratulations on that thank you and we have another documentary as well but um, it's a smaller one that about malta that i'm trying to work in with women's groups does that get tough for you when you have two features and a documentary and it's like you have a limited amount of storage, you have all this stuff that you're trying to work around and finagle while you're editing these projects? Yeah. There was a time when we were in Lisbon for five months and he was dragging this like whole container of bloody hard drives around. I, I carry my iMac with me. And I, right now on the desk, there's about like um, nine different hard drives sitting on my desk. And out of there, there's probably like a 20 more in the box next to me. So yeah. It's, it's a lot of storage, and I'm constantly buying new hard drives. So how do you it, it's a range. how do you guys keep it going? Like film after film, I'm assuming that there's successes that are happening and taking place to keep that creativity alive. Yeah, well, we we built up enough catalog like over the years of films. Now that like you know, they bring in like your know, money every single month, and like you know, we take that money and we put it into the next project, or like you. Know, Something like Cats of Malta, okay, it's like um, getting sponsorship like you know, for PBS. So, 
you know, there's some nice injection of funds coming in. I'll it's take those funds and I'll put it into editing, like, you know, the, the new films. It's also like about that. being smart with it too. Like when you market it to festivals, they ask for the film, you ask for money. You don't just say, oh, here it is. You'll actually negotiate a price. So it's about being smarter and not giving away the film. Oh, I want to get my film on every platform, but don't put it on everything that's going to be like not pay anything. Mm-hmm. So, But I think that's kind smarter. of the key. Like a lot of filmmakers think, oh, they're going to make one film and – they're going to be like your kind of an overnight success and, and that's it that's going to make their career. But it doesn't really work like that. You need to actually build up a library of film and it's just keep going and eventually, you know, it kind of just starts piling on top of each other. Now you got like enough films that like, you know, this one brings a little bit of money, this one brings a little bit of money and, you know, it just keeps, you know, compounding. Yeah, so that 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 is interesting. That is, that is very interesting because having a catalog takes so much effort and i think it's nice that there's two of you right because now you're getting double the output um i've i've created four feature films and my fifth feature is in post-production um i went through a distributor for my second and third film and then i'm gonna self-distribute the fourth and fifth film uh have you guys self-distributed your films or did you guys go through distributors what was that process like Everything's got everything self distributed except for Cats of Malta. We had a distributor for Friends, Foes, and Fireworks and my short film Daughter, but yeah, they were dodgy. So we got out of that and we learned the hard way that it wasn't working for us because, yeah, if you don't choose the right distributor, but our distributor for Cats of Malta is great. Mm-hmm. We have three distributors for that film. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got, yeah, three at the moment. Mm-hmm. But like other times, for other films, we're just on Film Hub. So self distribu- uh, distribution by Film Hub and you know, probably as you know, they get onto like you know, the main platforms like Amazon, yep. Tubi, um, Apple TV, even our DVD sales. Yeah, and then DVDs through Allied Born. So, and PBS is another. Distributor. And then occasionally you'll make kind of like sales to broadcasters. Like, um, what's that platform called? It's gone now, but there used to be a platform where like um, you know, uh, broadcasters will actually like you know, you can host your content on this platform, and broadcasters will approach you like you know, if they're interested in your work. And like you can make like your deals like that way. That's what I used to email you. Yeah, yeah, but actually, unfortunately, it shut down like earlier this year. Oh, so that was a loss. I forget what it's called. So that's yeah, that's that's also very interesting because I I think that for indie filmmakers, I think it's more beneficial to like you said build the catalog, but I also think it's more beneficial to self distribute your projects, especially if the distributors that you're talking to wants you to be responsible for all of the marketing, right? If you're going to be responsible for the marketing, then why wouldn't you just take the entire cut of your film? Why give it away unless they're able to get it to a platform that you just can't reach? Well, yes. that's, that's what we do. We carved it out with our distributor. We carved out what we wanted to keep and then he, we gave him the rest. And he, like, we were just lucky we got a good distributor mm-hmm. in yeah. the US and talking but about you, you make a really good point. Like a lot of distributors, they're not going to do much more for your film you can than do. you can do yourself just by putting it on Film Hub and then trying to make like your know, individual deals for platforms here and there yourself. Unless they and like you're kind of keeping the rights um, to your film, like you know, even Friends, Friends of Fireworks, um, we actually had a license deal for that one just a couple of you know, weeks ago. And that's a film that like was released 2018. So it's like six years old and like you know, it still has like a you know, kind of life in it and still making money. So you know, keeping the rights to your film long term, it can really be beneficial for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's where, that's kind of where I'm at. Like I have, uh, like I said, the fifth film's in post and the sixth film, uh, I wrote the script already and it's like planning to shoot that. And then the improv film that I was talking to you guys about, you know, mm-hmm. you guys give me inspiration on it now because it was just a conversation, but to hear that you guys have done it a few times, I'm like, man, we can knock this out in like two days. Um, yeah, good. I, I, I think I am going to go for it. Um, <laughs> that when you have so many titles i'm assuming you know you have let's say you have 10 titles and you own all the rights to all 10 if one is bringing in 100 bucks another brings in 300 one brings in 75 it's like by the end of that month it's like man you just got a surplus of a thousand dollars yeah it adds up it adds up and would you guys say that uh with all the titles and everything that you guys have done it's been more of a turtle pace a consistent turtle pace or have you guys had some sprints some slowdowns what was that pacing like had a few surprises. Yeah, we've had a few surprises, <laughs> like you know, kind of spikes in revenue, 
you know, this month and this month, and we're not sure why, and they'll just go down to back to the turtle place for like the next few months. And then, like a license still comes along, and like or suddenly there's another spike. Or, or yeah. the festival says, "I want your film, okay?" Yeah. So it, it's it's a mix of both. It's a turtle and a hare. Mm. So, do you guys still submit all of your projects when they complete two festivals, or do you just go straight to Film Hub release? We're we're in two minds about this one. For like a long time, we, we were, wrote an article. Yeah, about it we as well. weren't doing any festivals at all. We're just kind of going straight to like um, distribution. But this, it, the ego still creeps in, like but oh, yeah, maybe. But now we're kind of thinking, like we want to, like we we done festivals with Cats on Malta and had like a decent festival run, and like you know, bad. we're actually getting some you know, festivals approaching us, and we're getting screening fees to actually play Cats on Malta uh, at this particular festival and this festival. So Even we're more crazy. open to festivals these days, and even with the the new films, we want to like you know, we actually want to target festivals and actually target kind of indie cinemas can we like you actually manufacture a small like yeah. cinema run across europe or something like that we're trying to do something different with like each film like it depends on the film as well because like our other film no woman is an island the smaller one i said the documentary it's done a couple of like it's done a screening in parliament but it didn't really do a lot of festivals so just finding other ways to do that through education is that probably one day that's not going to have any more festivals it's gone into two festivals that's enough for that one what festivals can do for you is they can build up a, your cred for your film um and that just makes it you know more attractive to distributors and even to the audience because it kind of says you know you get that laurel like okay, this film is good enough you know maybe me as a distributor i should like actually watch it pay some attention to it me as an audience member i should actually like you know kind of watch it give it a chance it's so pretty sad. <laughs> yeah it's just about building some credibility for your work i think yeah yeah because i i you know i i so with one of my projects i've submitted it to sundance and the atlanta film festival and i'm just waiting but the project's mm -hmm. been done now for like a year and a half and i have this itch where i have everything loaded on film hub i have it all ready to literally push submit and I'm Ooh. literally waiting to see the results of the festivals. And I asked that question because I'm like, is it worth it to wait? Right. Because on one hand, it's like I always say it's like the lottery ticket. You're giving yourself a lottery ticket. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, I'm like, they get so many submissions. What's the likelihood that they even watch it? it it's yeah, it's, it's definitely a tricky one. Like, you know, like I said, we're in two minds about it. Um, and a lot of festivals. Sometimes we do, sometimes it depends for us. If we think that the film is good, like we think it might be good for festivals, we put it in. Like we have a lot of short films, mm -hmm. but we've only like recently put about two of them in. We've done thirteen in the series. We've only submitted two to festivals. Yes, yeah. a lot of festivals though are like kind of pre-programmed. They just get films from like your know, other festivals, and they already know what the lineup is going to be. So like you know, these filmmakers that submit in blindly, they have absolutely no shot at all, and the festival just uses them for revenue. So it is a path that you have to navigate carefully and kind of like, you know, kind of be really careful which festivals you enter. And set your budget too, so you don't get yeah. over. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's, I guess, where my curiosity comes in because I know that with the film I'm currently editing now, I'm not submitting the festival. Like mm -hmm. festivals, as soon as it's done, Film Hub released to the world and all of that money that I would have spent on submitting to all of the top festivals, that's just going to go straight to marketing. Yeah. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that approach. Like, we've done that in the past ourselves also. Like, we have a film called Incorporate, which is an erotic drama. And, you know, we never entered any festivals. It just went straight to distribution. And it's like, you know, one of our top selling titles. And festivals would have made a difference at all. It's, it's going to sell anyway. So what's the point? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's so interesting. So let me ask you guys this, right? I find it so fascinating that you guys are a married couple and you guys are within this space. How does it work at home? Uh, and the reason why I asked that is because, like, my wife and I, man, we've gotten into some fights <laughs> over this space. We don't really fight about much. We don't even fight much in general. But when it comes to filmmaking, we've sparred a few times. What is it like at home with you guys being with two creative minds that are all into making movies? I'm upstairs. He's downstairs. Yeah, exactly. and I'm yelling at him from up there. Yeah. She works from upstairs and I just put on my headphones and I edit and I can't hear anything. So it works so well. <laughs> that, you know what, what advice, let me ask you this. What advice would you give other couples that are in this space um, for ongoing peace? Get, get a cat. <laughs> oh, so the cat, the cat is the peacemaker. Exactly. He's right here lying next to us. 
Yeah. What's some of the best advice that you guys have got gotten, or what is some of the best advice that you would give to up and coming filmmakers? Someone told me when I was dancing, if there's no space for you, create your own space. And that's something I've always sort of done. Like if, if there's no, if there's no space for like, there's no way to like, there's no way to, to and no other way to make a film, just make a film. That's kind of how I see it. Like someone said that to me, Yeah. And just go ahead and do it anyway. Yeah, and I think I'm just going to echo something I said earlier, which is like, yeah, just don't give up. Like, it's not going to be one film. It might not even be the second film, it might not be the third film, but just keep going. Eventually, you'll have enough films and you'll be able to, like, yeah, make your own career. That is awesome. And if you could, if you could talk to yourself right now, like you're talking to the younger version of you and he's about to start on his first project, what would you tell him? Be careful of the egos out there. <laughs> Would you say that's that's like a big thing, especially in, in filmmaking? It is. It is. Like, um, I think all creative inter- industries, like, draw big egos. So you got to kind of be careful who you work with. But it's easy to get burned. I think it's easy to get ra- wrapped up in the romanticism of it, too. Like, I'm going to be this filmmaker. But then the reality is that you probably won't be able to, like, yeah, sustain yourself. For my- I've made my best friends, you know, kind of in filmmaking. I've all made my worst enemies in filmmaking. So <laughs> Really? I've always thought, yes. It's probably best that we keep to ourselves. You know, we don't really haven't really met any crazies here, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's it's interesting. It's such a uh, it's such a magical space, but it's mm-hmm. such a like I feel like a tormented space too, because yeah. it can be know, very competitive as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you're getting people are competing with you that you don't even know are competing with you with social media and everything. Yeah, yeah. So where, let me, good, good point. Where can people follow you guys if they want to know more about your story? They want to know, uh, they want to watch your films. Where can they go? How can they follow you? Uh, NexusProductionGroup.com is the website. And we have a newsletter on there. And we have our affiliate link for Film Hub on there too on the website. So there's all that. We have a YouTube channel as well called Micro Budget Madness, which we've been too busy to shoot videos for. We haven't done anything all year on it. <laughs> but I ha- I'm writing the scripts and we'll have some more videos soon because we wanted to build that this year. We've been, we were going really, we were doing really well with it. And then we just started here. Yeah, we had three films working on three features, so that stopped. But yeah, we have Micro Budget Madness, which we have a few videos on there about our our um, process of making films and Ivan's book is as well. Pretty much the website is the best the place to go because it all links from there. Yeah. That, you know, I, I find it so fascinating that you guys do so much, right? Like, okay, tell me if you think this way sometimes. You'll have somebody that let's say gets, you know, praise or accolades and they, let's say they're a director, they, they only direct or they're mm-hmm. a producer and they only produce. I'm and jealous. you guys are here wearing so many hats and it's like, Hey, Hey, what about us? Like we're doing all of this. What about us? Yeah. You, you do get that way. Sometimes you kind of like, yeah, I think that's just human nature to kind of like see your know, other success and you get like a little bit of envy. I think like, you know, that can't be helped. Um, but like, you, you just gotta have to, you just have to focus on your own work. Like, and you're at your own pace and I don't know. I'm not really kind of in, in this for the accolades are in this because I really enjoy filmmaking. I just can't see myself doing anything else. And what about you, Sarah? What was the question again? I was thinking about what you were saying. You know what? Then I'll ask you another question. Um, What advice would you give to a female filmmaker, a female director? They're working on their first project. What advice would you give them? I think that gender hasn't really got a lot to do with it. <laughs> I know it's a bit harder because there's less females in the industry and the way that women are viewed in film. But as a director, I would just say build a good team around you, I guess, because when you're learning, especially the first time you're directing, it helps to have people around you who have done it before. So I think that's that's a big one as well. So you always learn and just go and give it a go. Well, that is awesome advice. Ivan, Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you guys so much for joining me on the Hypertube Podcast. If, if there's anything else you want to say before we leave, now's your time. The light is shining on you. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.